That's the way of the world. You chose the title for this segment, That's the Way of the World. Why and what does it mean? That's a very personal question for me. It's uh, we, we, I reflect back to the 1970s as a child. And Earth, Wind, and Fire was my favorite singing group. And they had a song called That's the Way of the World. And part of the lyrics went something like, a child is born with a heart of gold, the way of the world makes the heart grow cold. And I think it's a reflection of me. I think my heart, over a period of time, isn't the same childlike, innocent heart it once was. So the challenges, the experiences, life itself kind of hardens the heart, if you will, over a period of time. And I think that's happened to me. As you look at the world, what are you most upset about? The mediocrity, the apathy, the sense that excellence is not important. It's the sense that people gain attention by being outrageous. No, no work, no body work, no excellence. Let's be famous. Let's just do something over the top. And so when the society has gotten to the point where it's over the top antics and shenanigans becomes the status quo, to me, excellence in the self-actualization of the human being is no and void. It falls by the wayside. So I'm very, very upset with the sense of mediocrity and apathy that's in the world today. How do you think we got to this point? Hmm. We got to this point because we, one, as a superpower, the United States is a superpower in the world, we took our eye off the ball in terms of how we got here. We're rugged individualists. We're innovators. We're passionate about our dreams and aspirations being manifested and fulfilled. So we're in line. We forgot about the art, the process, the work that goes into building a monolithic thing, whatever it is, a product, a service, an idea, a philosophy, a religion. And we went after money. And economics ruled the day, then and now, as it emerged. As a result of, we don't have any person saying, I'm going to stick it out for 15, 20, 25 years. Everyone wants to be an overnight success. So we got this way because we didn't appreciate the saliency and the brilliance that goes with the process, the loving of the, the art form of the process, and what it creates. What do you think your mindset has to be to survive and thrive today? Whew. You have to have a sense of mission, a sense of crusade, a sense of passion, a still determination, a sense of discipline, a regimen that you utilize every day to thrive in whatever thing that you're going after is about. And I believe that because, as I said earlier, because most people aren't going to work, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, a lifetime, no matter how long it takes. Whatever it takes, I'll do, I'm going to do it until I die. This is our passion. Because we don't have that eye to tiger, that fire in your belly, we have lost our way again. So I think that if we gain, regain that, those skill sets, that idea, that passion, then we can probably turn around this whole recession, become more innovative, and have life on a turn to be truly representative of an ideal to the world. How should an individual relate to others? In a win-win situation. Always trying to find a way of giving but also receiving. Never giving to the point where it hurts and pains you, but never receiving to the point where you're taking more than you know you deserve. If we can have that reciprocity, the law of reciprocity always in play, then we always can be effective as well as the person we're dealing with being effective, getting what they want. I feel that sometimes we're not, and I say this word, selfish enough. Selfish to the extent that you realize that you're the center of your universe, that everything you get and that you want is based on your actions and your mind in this world. I read some time ago this philosopher said, or this individual said, it's, you don't get out of the world what you deserve, you get out of the world what you command. And you command more by the sense of excellence that you pervade and convey to the world. That's how you get what you want in the end. Okay, speaking of philosophers, why are you so driven and focused in seeing your philosophy on charisma accepted in the realm of Plato or Machiavelli? Who's thinking these days? Everyone wants to be an entertainer or athlete. Where's the next Machiavelli? Where's the next Plato? The next Aristotle? The Rousseau's of the world? The Thoreau? No one wants to think. No one makes education sexy. Everyone wants to be, like I said, be like my, which is okay in terms of excellence, but in terms of what it takes to thrive and flourish and perpetuate what we create this far. Unless we become more erudite in our aspirations, we will never ever see the perpetuity of the greatness we've enjoyed in the past go into the future as it has has been in other dynasties or in the other uh, countries or sovereign nations that apparently had their perpetuity of their success over a period of time. 
In the past, you've been accused of being selfish, narcissistic, and driven by your ambition. What do you say to these allegations? Guilty. Guilty is charged. I'm guilty because, yes, I'm ambitious, yes, I'm selfish, and narcissistic. But let me explain why that's important to embrace. Because we all are. We all are built and steeped in self-preservation and maintenance. And unfortunately, sometimes in this Euro-Christian society and this trying to have it both ways, a dichotomy exists. We, we feel a certain way. Well, we have our looks, our intelligence, our money, our connections, our education. And you feel good about yourself when you achieve. But you're not supposed to tell anybody you feel good about yourself. You're supposed to play it down. No, 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 no. Don't blow your own horn. Let someone else blow it. Well, it's been my experience that if you wish for someone else to blow your own, own horn, it would never be blown. So I believe that when you embrace who you are fully, the chaff and the wheat, simultaneously, not trying to divide it up because my, my selfishness is steeped in two things. The self-confidence of the track record of being an achiever, but also the insecurity that comes with growing up in society. So it's telling you you're not good enough. And we all are probably victims of that to a certain extent. And so I believe that if we can embrace the ideas that I am the center of my universe, whatever I do with my mind and my hands will be the manifestation of whatever is going on inside me. And whatever contribution makes the world will be based on how I uniquely express myself in that perspective. So I don't shirk, I don't lament, I don't go around the idea of what it is to be selfish. As a matter of fact, I embrace it. And people are always chagrined by it, like, oh my God, you... That's a negative term to be narcissistic. Is that right? If I didn't think highly of myself or think in terms of my own ambition and who I am and where I want to go, we talked about, you asked me earlier about my the, the philosophy of charisma. I've been at this game for 15 years now. And guess what? There many years I didn't get anything. I didn't make any money. Not a dime. Side jobs to actually stay in the game. Because I believed. And now I'm seeing things come to manifestation, but for the most part, who who was my cheerleader? I was my own cheerleader, my own army, my own public relations firm, my own everything. While people might have been on the sidelines cheering me on, yeah, keep it going, I know you're going to make it, we believe you, I think. But invariably, it was all me trying to push myself and believe in this idea bigger than myself. So I had to become my own army, my own chilly, if you will. So my thing is when an individual feels that way and sees where they're going, in the end, they'll tell the world, ah, I told you so. And the world will guess what the world will say. I know it. Considering you embrace the idea of selfishness, how do love, family, and romance fit into your worldview? That's an interesting question because a lot of times I've been accused, again, of anti-marriage, anti-love, anti-commitment. And that's not true. I'm for all that. As long as I can be and do all I need to do and someone's with me who allows me to be all I need to be and all I want to do. And I believe sometimes when you have to make a choice between your goals and aspirations and your ambitions and the person you love to make that fit, I think in the long run you actually do yourself a disservice. I wasn't going to do myself a disservice. I've loved. I've had passion. I've had relationships that lasted years. But invariably, my love of what I'm doing, my mission, my crusade, supersedes all those kind of things but in the end because I feel like uh, if I don't do it, it won't get done. I feel like a woman who really loves me, she'll be there. She'll be there and she'll cheer me on. And even though sometimes she may feel like the mistress to my ambition, she realizes that she's always going to have a place there because with a man without a dream, without an ambition, he's nothing. He just going along, like get along like most people do in the world. And there's no real joy, real passion in that. I never wanted that kind of life. I want a life that I'm enjoying now, living to the fullest. And so, embrace that dynamic with me, and you'll get nothing but love from me. Wow. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Thank you.